This is NBC Television. Hello, I'm Alan Radio, and this is... Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. There's been a lot of noise about the election over the last few months, and the internet has been buzzing with the Vox Populi more than ever in the weeks leading up to and days just after the 2012 elections. I've noticed quite a bit coming from the free-thinking community, much of it incredibly insightful, which is generally what I look for in internet opinionation. This phenomenon has inspired me to produce this program, a radio picture. Tonight's episode, A Bucket Full of Christians, and a pocket full of freethinkers serves as my commentary and response to some of the things I've heard coming from freethinkers and not so freethinkers around the net regarding the elections. Several months ago, Penn Gillette was interviewed for a piece over at the Big Think titled An Atheist's Guide to the 2012 Elections, where he made a point that is so important and so overlooked by young freethinkers today that I felt it deserved more attention, particularly in post-election analysis. The only reason that Bachman and Rick Perry um, are able to say this stuff is because of a magic word. And this magic word is Christian. And if you look back in history, the word Christian doesn't really appear in the way we use it today until the anti-abortion debate in the 60s. When you had 1890 end of the 19th century, your top three highest paid speakers, the highest paid speakers, were atheists speaking about atheism. Robert Ingersoll, number one, Mark Twain, number two, Huxley, number three. Ingersoll was the, uh, the, the great infidel, the great skeptic, the atheist, Mark Twain, of course. And these are people speaking on, he was not reading from, he was not reading from Huck Finn. He was reading from Letters from Earth. He was reading atheist stuff. And Huxley, of course, Darwin's uh, pit bull, I guess bulldog at that time. I think of it as pit bull. There was a real sense of atheism being an important point. They were invited to the White House. And the reason was that Catholics were terrified of Baptists, who were terrified of Pentecostals, who were terrified of Lutherans, who were terrified of Evangelicals, the whole list. There wasn't a feeling of Christian. The Founding Fathers were very afraid of Baptists taking over from the Pentecostals. Everybody was afraid of the Catholics. So you had this divided thing. If we still had that, if we still were dividing people by sex, like we should be, sects, like we should be, one of the largest groups in this country would be atheists. By the uh, USA Today poll, I think, it was 22%, 20%. Even the lowest polls put it at 8 okay? The next highest would be Catholics, and they'd be knocking around 20 you know? Then you've got all your divided up categories. And then abortion happens, a legalized abortion, and some very smart uh, people, very forward-thinking people, decided we can never fight abortion if it's the Catholics fighting the Protestants, or fighting the Baptists, fighting the Pentecostals, fighting it. We have to get them under one tent. And there's a great book on this called The History of Free Thought. It's, these are not my ideas. Um, they pull this tent together and they kind of create the word Christian. And then Carter with Born Again Christian really helps with the word Christian. So what they've really done is they've taken very different philosophies. I mean, Catholicism and Protestantism are very different philosophies, very different, you know. And they've pulled it together uh, to make this term Christian, which are people that don't agree at all, and they say, I'm doing a Christian message. So Michelle Bachman and Rick Perry, just 40 years ago, really recently, would have been terrified to speak about their God and their church. 
Because the second they said they were Baptist, the second they said they were Pentecostal, the second they said they were Lutheran, all the other people fall away. But now they've got this magic word Christian. Not only is there no unified sense of Christian outside the abortion and gay marriage debate, there are in fact around 41,000 different denominations of Christianity, only a very few of which actually agree with each other. I grew up in a divided community. It was divided between Southern Baptists and the Church of Christ. The two churches didn't stop fighting each other until around 1992 when Roe v. Wade became a topic of national discourse again and the GOP was trying to get out the vote to re-elect Bush 1. They were back at each other's throats by 1995. One thing that the abortionists have accomplished is getting Baptists and Pentecostals to admit to each other that they both read the Bible. However, most of these denominations do not recognize Mormonism as a branch of Christianity. The majority of various Christian sects believe that Mormonism is a dangerous cult and many of them believe that it is a satanic cult. The difference here is what Penn pointed out towards the end of his big think piece. Mitt Romney uh, is wearing crazy underwear. He's wearing magic underwear. He is. I mean, uh, under his pants, he is wearing magic underwear. Magic underwear. And he believes that a convicted con man got golden tablets that no one else could see and sat with an angel to find out that the original Jews of the Bible were living in North America. <laughs> crazy, 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 but just more modern, not more crazy than other religions. Thinking people are well aware that the Mormon Church was founded by a convicted con man in the 1830s. We know most of the Mormon beliefs, and we know they are crazy. In the grand scheme of things, they've only been around a little longer than Scientology. People in the Christian bucket started off being suspicious of Romney. Romney had to earn their trust, and he didn't even really try. In fact, his religious contempt towards evangelicals was pretty obvious. Romney made the fundamental error of actually believing that his voting base, the conservative, evangelical, and fundamentalist Christians, were stupid enough to believe whatever he said simply because he was a Republican and he was a conservative. And evangelical and fundamentalists always support the Republicans. Most people in the Christian bucket believe that Romney is a believer in a false prophet, and Mormons believe that Christians have fallen away from God's true teachings through the prophet Joseph Smith. Any conviviality between these two is assuredly theater. Bush was able to get away with lying to his base because he is a part of that base. He, like Jimmy Carter, describes himself as a born-again Christian. He knows how to speak the born-again language. Romney does not. Romney speaks arrogant Mormon prick. Let me help you understand, and, it's, and you don't understand my faith like I do. All right, so, so give me for a moment the benefit of the doubt that having been a leader in my church, a bishop and a state president, I understand my church better than you do. To most Christians, Romney can never be in the same Christian bucket as they are. Lesbian Presbyterian ministers are more Christian to many evangelicals than Mormons will ever be. The only thing Romney had going for him was his theocratic beliefs that stem from his Mormonism, which has always been a theocratic religion. Joseph Smith kept getting run out of towns in Illinois for preaching Mormonism and the virtues of a Mormon theocratic republic, which he termed a theodemocracy, until he was finally killed in 1844 in Nauvoo, Illinois, in jail while facing charges for ordering the destruction of the Nauvoo Expositor newspaper, which had accused him, among other things, of trying to set himself up as a theocratic king. Romney can get on board with the Dominionists who wish to convert America into a Christian theocracy because Mormonism is an openly theocratic religion. Utah 
The seat of Mormonism is an openly theocratic state and was founded as such in 1847. Now, this brings me to an important point. The Christian bucket, which has been invented to gather the anti-abortionists, is really like a big bucket of water. Christianity, without the bucket, really looks more like a desert wasteland with little puddles of oil dotted all over the place, each puddle with a different type of oil, and each puddle distinctly unique in its individual characteristics. This bucket gave political and religious PR guys, oh yeah, religions have their marketing firms too, this bucket gave these PR guys the ability to go out into this desert of Christianity and scoop up all of the different types of oils and deposit them in a single location, that being the bucket of water. When all the different types of oils are dumped into the bucket, and the bucket gets stirred up with issues like abortion and gay marriage, it's kind of hard to tell that it's really a bucket of water with a bunch of different types of oils swirling around in it and it becomes easy to forget that not only does oil not mix with water, but once you drain the water out of the bucket, you now have a container filled with different types of oils, most of which won't mix with each other. Once all these religions got dumped into the bucket, some of the oil puddles found they were compatible with other oil puddles, and they merged and formed what became the catch-all non-denominationalist Christianity. This is the branch of Christianity which is the most dominionist, the most theocratic, the most fundamentalist, and also the most capable of navigating the murky waters of the bucket of Christianity. This is what has enabled groups like C Street, the Family, the Moral Majority, the Christian Coalition, and the Council on National Policy to accumulate so much political power and influence in America today in, the la in less than three decades. These are the people who founded the nation's megachurches. Many Christians are aware of this dynamic on some level and are wary of who is allowed to finally control the bucket of Christianity. Currently, evangelicals and non-denominationalists control the bucket primarily through megachurches, lobbies, and political think tanks and councils. If Mormonism controlled the bucket, then what might happen once all the water was drained out and Mormonism was left in control with the label of Christianity? This is the primary factor which cost Romney the election. He was unable to carry the majority of the evangelical vote. Don't get me wrong, thousands of evangelical pastors strongly advocated for Romney illegally from the pulpit this year. However, this represents only a single digit percentage of pastors in the Christian bucket. Here in Northwest Ohio, where a radio picture is produced, several of our local papers have uh, been chalking up Romney's loss to his ability, his inability to effectively connect with the evangelicals he had struggled to court throughout the campaign process. Most blame this on his shifting positions on abortion and other hot button divisive issues throughout his political career. Romney was completely oblivious to Christian mistrust of him and arrogantly believed he could just say whatever he wanted and those idiots who don't know the truth of God's true prophet Joseph Smith will still vote for me anyway because they're too stupid to accept the truth even when it is brought to their doorsteps by socially retarded kids with ties and short sleeve button up shirts calling themselves elder. Many people in the Christian bucket adhere to outrageous conspiracy theories about the Mormon Church and its relationship with Freemasonry and the Illuminati and the New World Order. Romney was oblivious to this fact. This obliviousness and his arrogant insistence on his own ignorance cost him the election. It is important that freethinkers also not be oblivious to the history of this bucket full of Christians. 
and we should take care to consider that when we're talking about Christianity, we're really talking about a bunch of different religions, most of which can't stand each other as much as they can't stand you. This is why I can never concede that America was founded on Christian values. The divisions within Christianity were one of the social dangers perceived by the Founding Fathers. The whole idea of the Christian foundation of America is nothing more than oily slop that has spilled over the edges of the bucket of Christianity and is a wet, greasy mess which requires wiping up, not a legitimate thought which deserves any reasonable consideration. Say, who gets to make the coffee in your house? Well, you know, more often than not, when it's coffee time in this household, I get to make it. Of course, the fact that my wife lets me make the coffee tells you how amazing Instant Maxwell House must be. And believe me, this really is amazing. It's a completely different kind of coffee. Here, take a look for yourself underneath this magnifying glass. Now you can see it's not a powder, not a grind either, but millions of tiny hollow flavor buds of real coffee formed this way to capture and preserve that famous Maxwell House flavor. Now these miracle flavor buds burst instantly the moment you pour in hot water, flooding the pot with that wonderful good to the last drop flavor. I want to tell you that is real coffee. As delicious as the best cup of coffee you ever have brewed. What's more, with this large jar you save money, you know. Up to 75 cents compared to three pounds of ground coffee means that Instant Maxwell House costs you less per cup. So this is Rex Marshall reminding you, no matter who makes the coffee in your house, the secret of coffee that's good to the very last drop is right in this jar with the stars on top. Instant Maxwell House. The Amazing Coffee Discovery. Boy, that's good. To the last drop. Meanwhile, on both sides of the Atlantic, the American election has stirred many emotions among the online community of outspoken freethinkers. Texas blogger, The Barking Atheist, had this to say. I cannot vote for a man that although there are things that he does that I do support, there are other things, much more things that I fundamentally disagree with him on. I cannot vote for this man. I cannot and I will not. Anyone who wants to say that I'm helping Romney win by not voting for Obama can go fuck themselves. Romney won't win whether or not I vote for Obama or Stein or Paul or Johnson. He will not win. I cannot compromise my ethics in hopes of the lesser of two evils. I cannot compromise my ethics in a way that I feel like my vote, my voice, has contributed to the perpetuation of the many problems this world faces. Call me a foolish idealist for wanting actual change. Call me a foolish idealist for voting for someone that I actually believe in. Call me a foolish idealist for wasting my vote. Call me a foolish idealist for not voting for someone who is perpetuating the war crimes of his predecessor and the economic system that does nothing but bring about inequality and suffering for the many for the benefit of the few. In the first part of his piece, he accused the president of everything from torture factories to drone strike genocide, which drew a myriad of responses from around the net, mostly negative. Renowned British blogger Coughlin Triple Zero made a particularly poignant observation. Onto the Barking Atheist video, in which he's, he's kind of saying that he's not voting for Obama for this, that, and the other reason, which I'm not going to get into. Um, and now he's voting for the Green Party, and he's getting a lot of stick for the things he says in this video, because it comes across... That's very petulant. Now, Barking Atheist, I don't want to have a go at you. Um, you vote for who you want to vote for, mate. Now, you'll say you're voting for the Green Party. That's fair enough. I think the reason you're getting a lot of flack, and the reason a lot of people are fucking having a problem with your video, is, and I could be wrong here. If I'm wrong, fucking point it out. But I, I look through your channel. I can't see any videos about the Green Party. 
I can't see you making videos saying let's talk about the Green Party and their issues. I haven't seen you do anything. I mean, YouTube is the biggest platform you've got uh, as a person. You can talk to more people in a day on a YouTube video than you can going out in the street. And it's like, the problem with a lot of people is, when it comes to the big elections, and this is the US election, which is the biggest election in the world, US presidential election, is that people like yourself turn up and you start saying that what you're not that you're going to vote for this party because you can't vote for this. and it's like that's all well and good but what have you actually done in the past 4 years because here's the thing that people need to remember right politics doesn't happen once every 4 years it's not something that happened if you wanted if you were someone i guarantee you if you'd have been making green party pro green party videos for the last few years not constantly, but regularly. If you were someone who promoted and jumped on board with the Green Party, you know what? You'd be fine. People would be like, fair enough, we know he's voting for that. He's made a channel, he's been making videos, promoting them for the last God knows how many years. But you haven't done that. It's like you've just decided in the last week, because you've made this video the eve of the election. So it's like you've just decided in the last week, oh, I'm going to vote for the Green Party in some sort of display of uh, political. And the problem is, and that's all well and good, but if you've done nothing to promote this third party or their cause for the previous four years, then why should anyone take your objection seriously? Why indeed? When only a few months prior, the Barking Atheist made a half-hour-long film explaining that he was advising people to vote for Rick Perry in the Republican primary because Perry and his particular brand of crazy would more easily ensure an Obama re-election. So ever since the Republican primaries began, I've been telling people to vote for Governor Rick Perry once the primaries came to their state. The reason I told people to do this was because Mr. Perry, who is the governor of the fine state I inhabit at this very moment, was a sure way to get President Barack Obama re-elected. Where were the histrionic, hyperventilating speeches demonizing Obama and extolling the virtues of Jill Stein then? Did you know you would be voting for Jill Stein back in March when you made the film? Were you even a Green Party supporter back then? We don't know, and the evidence suggests that it is unlikely. This reminds me of young American, upper-middle-class, lifestyle anarchists ranting about how they are the ones fighting for real change in America and how everyone else is a part of the problem. And they actually believe this justification because they go to one or two national-level protests, such as a G20 meeting, and attend anarchist conferences once or twice a year to talk about white male guilt, and then spend the rest of the year getting over a malt liquor hangover, spray painting circle A's on the back alley walls to express their individuality and free speech and alienating everyone who doesn't agree exactly with everything they say, regardless of how ill-researched and ignorant it may be. This represents a kind of thinking which has become increasingly prevalent in America in the last two decades of human development a lot of feeling with a little thought. This is what happens when your emotions get the better of you and spiral out of control. If we act on our feelings without stopping to consider the facts and the potential ramifications of our actions, then we overreact and make mistakes. In the best cases, we only end up making ourselves look like an idiot. However, in the worst cases, we invade other countries and bomb their women and children over weapons of mass destruction that were never there. This is Allen Radio reminding you to keep your thinking free and your feelings under control. Good night.